I'm Josh. Uh, thank you. Hey. Uh, I am by night Wimps CEO, um, but I am by day a community manager at O'Reilly Media. Uh, I got my start as a web developer a long time ago. Sometimes I like to call myself a full stack developer, but the reality is I'm more like a short stack developer because who really understands the full stack? Uh, so I got my start in LAMP development and I've moved my way, I've moved sort of away from being in the thick of development. I still build websites every once in a while. Mostly I build tools for myself in marketing at O'Reilly and every once in a while I'll help with, with the WIMP stuff, but that's all cool mostly. Um, so my point is that, the reason I'm, I'm making this kind of weird introduction is that now that I'm working at O'Reilly Media, and this is a company that's been publishing on technology for 36 years, I want to say, 29 at least, maybe 36, somewhere in there. Uh, and now O'Reilly covers data science and web development and security and infrastructure. It's, it's crazy. Um, and so now that I'm sort of in the belly of the beast um, and I'm no longer on the front lines building things, I have more perspective than I used to on what web development is, uh, how to make choices in web development. So that's the point. This is why I'm talking about becoming a web developer. Um, I've seen a lot. I've failed a lot, as we talked about a little bit there. Um, and I just want to share what I know, uh, just a map for becoming a web developer. So the way I'm going to go about this is there are sections here. This is the first time I've given this talk. Um, so I'm going to talk through a section. And then we'll do questions on that section, and we'll move on after that. Because I don't want this to be like a lecture. That's no fun. All right, becoming a web developer. Let's talk about getting a clicker to work properly. <laughs> there we go. All right, web development. This is the part that we all know in our hearts. What is the web platform? Well, we think we kind of know. I actually wrote up a little definition. This is the only thing I will read, I promise. Mm -hmm. A hypermedia communication medium with client server architecture. Right? We all kind of get that hypermedia, there's different types of media. Um, originally delivering content exclusively to browsers on desktop computers. That's kind of quaint considering where we are now, because now it's to browsers on all sorts of devices, and we also have web, uh, web APIs that are powering mobile applications. We have web APIs that are powering plants that tweet. I mean, uh, the web is everywhere at this point. So at the core of the web, we have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, we know that those are markup, your content, CSS mm -hmm. is your styles, presentation, JavaScript is your behavior. Um, let me just say this, the web fundamentally is only HTTP and HTML. Like those are the only things you should ever take granted when you're building a website. Because not everybody has JavaScript enabled, uh, even if they do have JavaScript enabled, they may not have as much memory on their machine as you think they do. Um, all you can rely on is HTTP and HTML, and that will lead you to taking a content-first approach to your web development, which bodes well when new devices come onto the market, and uh, rather than having to add new breakpoints to your responsive design, um, you've, you've, so already, you've, you've already prepared yourself for ad adaptation if you've built it content-first. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Stacks are another core part of web technology and the way that we think about the web. So stacks, the one that most people are familiar with is the LAMP stack. Linux, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. The reason we're most familiar with that is because those are all open source. And setting up PHP on Apache shared web hosting, which is cheap. I mean, you can get web hosting for practically for free. Um, that's why PHP is dominant, and of course WordPress and Drupal are built in PHP. So um, that's one of the main stacks. We're going to talk about the other stacks that are out there uh, in a little bit. And of course servers. Servers underlie like the whole thing. And I know this is super basic, right? But we've got to talk about the basics to before we can move on. Um, servers, of course at the center of it we have web servers. Uh, Apache, Nginx, IIS, whatever the server is, you always need a web server. Um, but that's not it. If you're new to web development, these things often will come as a surprise to you. You have to deal with name servers. You know, when you register a domain name, you set name servers with that web host to point, uh, to resolve that domain name to an IP address. And those name servers on them have uh, zone files. And those zone files 
help route an individual's request to the right server. So with WIMP, we have uh, where our DNS is handled by Amazon, and we have a bunch of different rules saying that okay, well if you go to WIMP, be a WIMP .com or .org, go to this server. But if you go to gives.beawimp.com, go to this other server. That's all handled in zone, zone files. Um, these are kind of like arcane, like if you've ever actually had to manage a name server, it's kind of painful. We, we'll get to questions afterwards. Um, it's, it's no fun. Um, beyond name servers, we have mail servers. Try to avoid running your own mail server. Uh, you generally get caught in spam filters. And if your server has any security issues and it's used to send like a bunch of email, well, your server's IP address can get blacklisted. And if you're on a shared web host, which if you're not paying very much, most you probably are, um, your website can get someone else blacklisted and vice versa. Like you don't have to be the bad actor to have that IP address uh, that you're sending email from uh, end up in the doghouse. So there are services like SendGrid and Amazon and a bunch of others who, who will send email for you. Um, I highly recommend using those. Okay, the last server that I'm gonna address uh, are the database servers. And those are really like the heart of the modern web because pretty much everything we use is powered by databases. In databases, we've got, uh, we've got relational databases. These are the classic databases, storing transactions and relating those things to each other. There's a principle in databases that you want to be familiar with, and it's, it's important because the types of database you, the database you choose, um, it, it, I mean, this is how you make the decision, basically. There's something called the ACID principle. I'm going to have to read this. Like, I lied. I'm going to read again. <laughs> ACID is uh, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And all relational databases have most of those attributes, um, not all to the same extent. And the reason that you want to look at those databases versus, say, a NoSQL document store or a graph database is that when you make a transaction, if it fails, you need to be sure that it fails completely. You know, if I'm running a bank or a store and I'm uh, engaged in commerce with somebody, just because the application fails doesn't mean there should be half a transaction stored in my database. There needs to be a transaction or no transaction at all. And these are one of those, so this is one of those reasons why you would choose a relational database. Um, relational databases are also great if you're trying to do data science, because uh, you can relate things to each other and build novel views. Could you go to that asset on that time? That's atomicity, mm -hmm. consistency, isolation, and durability. So just to briefly touch on the other types of databases, there are no SQL databases. And really, when someone says no SQL, they're talking about document storage. So MongoDB, CouchDB, Cassandra, Redis, these are not databases in the typical sense. Basically, you throw a bunch of data at them, and they store it. They don't ask any questions. They don't say, hey, where's your schema? Or hey, this is too many characters. Or hey, this is the wrong format. A NoSQL database will just store the document. It's, it's that simple. Um, so NoSQL is ideal for chat logs uh, or logging in general because you don't really care about um, uh, it being atomic or, or having the ACID compliance in the same ways. Anywho, graph databases are these newfangled things. And they're not actually that new. They're just becoming more common. And graph databases are things like the giant database behind Facebook um, that relates entities to each other um, in a different way, and then graph databases care about edges and all these data science-y things that I think she could probably speak to better than I could. So moving on from servers and web technology, let's talk about web thinking. So this is the part that I think a lot of people, I think this is the part that we miss. Um, Web, the web is driven by standards, right? We've got those three, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and each has a different set of standards bodies behind it. Behind it. This is like, not just an artifact of the way things work. Like, this is why the web is as fucking awesome as it is. Like, <laughs> seriously, if the web wasn't governed by standards bodies, it would just become another Java or another .NET, another monolith 
that uh, no one really wants to contend with. So the standards bodies are nonprofit organizations that are arbiters between us developers, the browser vendors, and in theory, the consumers. Uh, they're not really at the table, so they're not represented, represented. We have to kind of represent them. Because each technology, each language is governed by different standards bodies, they can evolve independently of one another. And I can't stress enough how meaningful that is. Like, that's, that's a big freaking deal. You know, mono, uh, .NET and Java only evolve when Oracle or Microsoft decide they need to evolve. And when they evolve, it's, I mean, sure, they have teams internally that, uh, that are focused on different sides of the projects. But they're still all part of the same whole. They're a monolith. And so they don't evolve independently of each other. So this is why the web has become as good as it is. It's the best, play, it's the best way to deliver content. It's the best way to style something. JavaScript is getting to be the best. We're working on that one. All right. So beyond standards bodies, we've got open source. And again, open source has, like 10, 20 years ago, this was radical. Like thinking that there would be software that you would just give away, that was actually radical. And I'm not talking like, let's throw rad the word radical around like it means nothing. Like it was actually crazy. Um, and it required a whole new legal framework. And, it's, and this legal framework is now expanding way beyond technology, which is awesome, but totally outside the scope of the conversation here. But because uh, many of the tools of the web were open source, the web succeeded. You know, there were many competing languages and, and uh, I mean, HyperCard and there's a whole like litany of failed technologies that some people would argue were superior. But because the web was driven by standards bodies, because the web is built on primarily open source technology, Again, let's go back to that LAMP stack, which runs the majority of the web. Linux is open source based on Unix. Uh, Apache is an open source, a set of open source projects, um, but also the web server. MySQL is open source-ish, thank you, Oracle. Um, because these things are open source, they were able to proliferate. You know, when you buy, you pay for your $5 a month or $50 a month web hosting, you're not also paying a ton of licensing fees. And neither is your web host. Now, if they're getting enterprise support, that's another deal. But bottom line is, open source has made this available as part of what's, what's amazing. And I'll talk more about intellectual property a little later. I promise not to get too boring about it. APIs and mashups. This has been, this is, those aren't exactly the thing that I'm trying to capture here, but they're related to the thing I'm trying to capture here, which is that the web is interoperable, right? So, uh, this whole web 2.0 thing, which the marketing buzzword kill, just, it's annoying, but it means something. Uh, web 2.0 marked a shift in the way that we built websites. I mean, of course, the big thing that typifies web 2.0 is Ajax, reloading content on the screen without a whole page refresh. That's kind of novel, and that, that's helpful for building single page web apps and, and, and well, websites that behave like applications. That's, that's a meaningful change. But the other side of that that's, that's important is the APIs, right? I mean, how many websites do you use that also use Google Maps? <coughs> like, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and RSS feeds, like blogs, like content. APIs are part of the web. It's about getting your data out there and allowing other people to build on top of it. Um, all the other Twitter clients that are out there, all the different ways to interact with, with the web is because most web services have added APIs that allow you to do that. Um, so that's just an important way to, important thing to keep in mind as you're building things that are beyond, say, brochureware. You know, if you're building an application and you are concerned about the business case and you want to make sure that people are using it, well, make sure to build an APIs. Okay, last point here, the uncertain web. This gets back to what I begun with, uh, began with, which is the web is no longer about desktop on uh, browsers on the desktop anymore. Like it's so much more than that. We've got we've got watches now. There's a new content type specifically for the Apple Watch. Uh, we now have Android running in cars. We have Microsoft running in cars. Apple's rumored to be coming out with a car. Uh, so TVs, cars, watches, 
there are all these places that we didn't expect to be like building applications and interfaces for. And so what I mean by the uncertain web, and I'm stealing that title, that's the title of, of an O'Reilly book, but the uncertain web is about not having control over where your web, where your content is going, right? This is again why I say the only things you can take for granted are HTTP and HTML, because you don't know if they're gonna have JavaScript or a lot of memory on their machine. So with the uncertain web, I mean, the, the point that I wanna make is that the lack of control that we as builders have is a feature, not a bug, right? I mean, it's, when we try to build websites that are pixel perfect, of course it's gonna feel like a bug, right? Because we're never gonna make them pixel perfect across the litany of, of devices that are out there. But when we accept the fact that it's a feature and we build content first websites and things like that, then it's not so painful. Um, NPR has a series of blog posts that they did with Programmable Web a number of years ago. And I'll, I'll add this to my notes uh, later. <clears throat> but what they did is they, they um, you know, NPR, a massive media organization, they enacted a principle called COPE, create once, publish everywhere. And what they did is they basically had a, da a normalized database with their content in it, and they had a series of filters that would run when that, data, when that data was leaving the database, and those filters would be run based on the type of device it was going to. Right, okay, so when we're building WordPress and Drupal websites, we, not, we, may, we may not be building something with that sophisticated of an architecture, but we should still be thinking the same way. We're putting content in there, the themes should be simple, and then we should use a principle called progressive enhancement rather than graceful degradation. So we think about building up from the base HTML and HTTP rather than building something with all the bells and whistles and then learning how to make it work on old devices. Okay, that's web thinking. Again, this is kind of pedestrian, but I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. Um, editors and process ed editors are like, this is where you live your life as a developer. You know, outside of your time with the client and interfacing with other people, you're spending your time in your editor. Um, and whether you're using Notepad or Sublime Text or Note, I don't even know what they use on Windows anymore. God, it's been too long. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or, or if you're coding in Visual Studio, no plus plus. thank you, Notepad++, plus plus. Um, Eclipse, etc. There's a whole range of editors from like the very like the stripped down to the integrated development environments. They're all awesome, but my one word of advice is don't use an integrated development environment if you're not using all of the features. Like if you're just using an IDE because it automatically uploads to your website when you hit save, like that's not a good reason to use an IDE. Um, try experimenting with the other features it has, like the built-in testing or the code hints and things like that. Um, anywho, I'm not gonna lecture you on your editor choices, but there are choices out there. Okay, <laughs> version control. Like, hey, 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 <laughs> you can you can for everything. It's true, I will, but I won't for now. Um, <laughs> version control. Seriously, even if it's just a one-person project, use some form of uh, version control, source control, same thing. Whether it's Git or Mercurial or, God forbid, it's SVN or CVS, doesn't matter as long as you have a form of version control. Now, if you don't know what version control is, that's okay, but if you leave with one thing in mind and one thing you remember, it should be this. Uh, you don't want to have, like, you, try, you don't want to have to keep track of the versions on your own. Use software for that. When you make a mistake, you can easily revert to the last version of your software. Um, especially when you are coding on teams, for instance, say me and Cole want to work on the same same file in the in the code repository. Well, it would be really shitty if we're working on the same file and we overwrite each other's changes, right? So version control, source control helps you manage things like that. Okay, compilers. Uh, question? Yeah, about the version control. Yes. It, when you're just one person working on the files, how do you pick the point at which you commit to the system? Because what I find is that I, I tend to just go and, mm -hmm. and I never, basically I'm probably not committing as often as I should. So I'm willing to bet that wars have been fought over this exact question. <laughs> um, because it can be as atomic or as 
gargantuan of a commit as you like. Um, and I'll be honest, I've never been, I've never had a great habit in terms of using version control consistently. So I'm just trying to make sure that everybody else has a good habit. <laughs> um, I, I would, yeah, I mean, I think you've got a sense of maybe you're committing not as often as you'd like to, or maybe, maybe not as often as you should. Um, I think it's reasonable to suggest that when you have a feature that you're working on, you want to make a branch from your main from the main trunk or repository, right? And then as you're working on that feature, uh, just be intentional about what changes you're making and then commit them. I think the trap um, that I have fallen into is just just hacking at something until it works, right? And like that's not exactly a great habit. Uh, because you, what, I, what I end up doing is I end up changing half a dozen things and I don't know which one thing made it work. Uh, so I would advocate for pretty atomic commits. Okay, compilers. Compilers are not something we have to deal with a whole lot on the web, which is really nice. Um, but compilers are still uh, an important part of the process when you get to things like I want to build a mobile application, but I want to use web technology. Or I want to code in ECMAScript 7 or 6, but have it still work on browsers that only support ECMAScript 5. So there are now cross compilers. There are also sometimes called transpilers. There are also backpilers. So you can write in the most modern version of the language, but support devices that don't support that version of the language. Um, those are all very useful tools. You're, you may bump into them. But the one thing that um, is in my mind closely associated with compilers that is very important to think about for all web developers is the build process, right? So whether you are just using a build process because you want to have tests that run every time you, you build, you make those changes, or if you, are, if you have a build process because you've got uh, SAS or Compass or less, you know, you've got some CSS that needs to be post-processed before it goes to the browser. That's all part of the build process. And there are an incredible number of tools to help with build processes these days. It really depends on the types of the stack that you're using, um, what build tools you use. But I would encourage everybody to, you know, once you've gotten past, once you've gotten comfortable with the types of, with the coding itself, not that you're an expert or anything, but, but just when you just feel kind of comfortable with it, start stretching yourself a little bit more and try to have a build process. Um, it will add, it's reassuring. Um, basically, you know, the reason that WIMP was, we launched our website and then we had to revert it, is we don't have a, we don't have a build process with testing involved. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not, you're not paid. <laughs> but, yes, please. Go tease that out a lot more, because that's a term that the build process? Yeah. Okay, so there are two types of build processes. There's the build process that happens at your command when you're ready for it to happen. And then there are build processes that, that you can have um, just run the build once you make a change. Um, but what the build process is, regardless of how it's being initiated, is uh, a process that involves Say you have configuration files that for production versus development environment, okay? Well, when you run the build process, based on whether you say it's going to your production server or your development server, it might substitute some variables in, right? Like here's the database login for the dev server, here's the database login for the production server. It might also take your code and minify it, right? So it might obfuscate it and, and pull all the, all the last performance optimizations it can out of it. Um, the most important thing really though for a build process is testing. And again, it's not, it's painfully uncommon, um, but it's really important to have because when you have testing as part of your build process, when the build completes and you, and it's the, all the tests pass, you, you can like rest comfortably. It's nice to have that kind of assurance. Does that make a little more sense? So basically it's kind of a rubric for whatever you put together to go from writing the code putting it into production. Exactly, exactly. That's a good way to do that. Testing, compiling, configuring, 
<laughs> right, exactly. You can have a whole stew of things that are a part of it. But it really is about just taking your, your raw code and um, putting it into an environment where it's running. Okay, project management. I'm just going to say a couple of things about this. Because again, wars have been fought about over this cliff. Um, there's two, type, two basic types of project management. There's waterfall and there's iterative, sometimes called agile. Uh, waterfall is I, I, I design it, I throw the design over the wall to a developer, the developer codes it, the developer throws it over the wall to the marketer who puts content in it, and then God knows what happens after that. Uh, that is a very contrived example, but that's more or less what Waterfall is about. It's about big milestones where you hand things off to somebody else. Uh, iterative is about, again, I'm just going to try to stay, not to stay away from specifics because there are lots of schools of thoughts on this. Iterative is basically about picking an achievable task in uh, a time frame that you define, often it's two weeks, and then building that and then doing another two weeks, and slowly just building things until you have what you need. Uh, this is a false dichotomy. Like, realistically, any most decent processes ha have, have a mix of both, right? You can't just, uh, you need some level of waterfall to have like a grand vision, to, to like a coherent vision. You need some level of iterative so that you're not making the mistake of planning ahead too much, and then you end up shooting yourself in the foot. The nice thing about having some level of iteration is that it gives you feedback on things that aren't working well. So for instance, if I'm building a website that um, you know, the designer had one idea about how content should be displayed and the, the, the copywriters, if there's, like a, if there's like a conflict in the vision that these people had and, and you have an iterative process, well that conflict is going to be resolved within two weeks. If you have a project that's completely waterfall, and that designer or that, that marketer is just going to wait until something shows up on their doorstep and then they have a disagreement, it's much harder to fix things when you're that far along in the process. So there are a couple different methodologies there. They're totally a false dichotomy. Um, none of, there's no panacea that people will say that like, this is, this is the one true way. It's not true. It's not true. Uh, the last thing, bit of advice I have on project management, is find a tool and stick to it. Um, it's very easy to, especially in technology, to be obsessed with our tools uh, and to really be like, oh, shiny, I think this one will work for me. And it may, maybe it is better, maybe the grass is greener. Um, <clears throat> but unless you've seriously spent a few months trying to make a, a project management tool or software work for you, you don't know. You don't know how good it's going to be for you because you have to build routines around those things. So, um, and I'm saying this as a cautionary tale. I spent like 14 years of freelancing, never settling on a single tool, and that was stupid. <laughs> there's, there's no other way of putting it. Um, and now that I'm at O'Reilly, and O'Reilly is sort of defining for me the tools that I use, I realize, huh, okay, I've built up some habits. I can, I can use, I can think about project management this way. So just pick a tool, stick to it. All right, last bit here, uh, distributed development. Increasingly, people are not working together in a room to build this, these projects, right? Oftentimes there's me, the developer, who is working with a designer who is in West County, and there's a marketer who brought the project to us, and the marketer is in San Francisco. I mean, God knows what the configuration is. You could have a, a team of developers working on an app streaming across a nation or across the globe. Um, it's very decentralized, very distributed, a lot more remote work. And uh, the reason that I'm bringing this up is just to know that you really need to work extra hard to stay in communication in these situations. I mean, it goes without saying, right, because you're not there in, in the flesh with these people. But you really do have to make it a point to try harder to communicate with these teams uh, when, when you're distributed that way. Be proactive in your communication. and. Uh, Slack for the win. Instant messaging will be your best friend, I swear to God. Okay, moving on from the boring stuff to an example of more boring stuff, the waterfall methodology. This is just an example of uh, one way of thinking about building a website. 
you've got your research, you've got your wireframes, you move on to like building comps, you code those up. This is, I think, a dated way of thinking about it. I think this is roughly the order of concerns, right? I mean, you don't want to start building stuff until you have research. But I think it's a lot more realistic these days to, uh, to have a lot of these things happening concurrently, right? So I can be, there can be a team writing content, there can be a team mocking up style tiles, and then there can be developers building the back end. And hey, when we're, when we're all done, we come together and we apply those style tiles to a front end that's added to the back end. And um, like it, it's another way of looking at things in an, in an iterative way. Um, sorry, a little bit of a tangent there. This is, again, just one way to visualize a website process. OK, let's talk about actually getting things done. Um, like what it's really like out there. Uh, of course, I've mentioned, I've talked enough about LAMP. LAMP is like the de facto. It's, if you want to be employable really quickly, that's where people often start. Um, WordPress, Drupal, Joomla, um, and beyond. It's really easy to get started in LAMP. There's tons of work to be found. But there's also a challenge in that it's, it's kind of a trap for a developer. If you want to move on in your career, well, maybe you should keep exploring outside of that. Uh, and I say this as a person who is a Drupal developer, and I defined myself as a Drupal developer for about five, six years. And when I finally started paying attention to the rest of the world, I realized, like, oh, shit, I'm barely employable anymore. Um, so don't, unless web development is already a secondary skill for you, and, and then LAMP development's probably fine, um, seriously consider the other stacks that we're going to look at later. All right. So LAMP is sort of the de facto standard. Uh, frameworks and CMS. So it's no, there's no reason that any of us should be reinventing the wheel, right? Like developers have done that. They've built better wheels than we ever could. So this is why we have frameworks out there like, uh, like Django, like Laravel, like Yi, Code Igniter. And then we have content management systems, which are frameworks on steroids. Because uh, a framework is something that you might use to build an application. Uh, a content management system could be used to build an application, but oftentimes it's more a ready-made site in itself. So, example, uh, to use WordPress or to use Drupal or Joomla, a content management system, to build an application, in some cases you may have to do more work to make that system bend over backwards to make it do what you want. Sometimes you're better off sticking with a, a framework rather than a content management system and starting from there. Now, one thing that frameworks and CMS have in common is most of them are based on the MVC um, model view controller pattern, um, the architecture, excuse me. Model view controller, I can't talk a whole lot about that, but just know that that's, that's an architecture that's in there that's common that will get you very far. If you can feel comfortable in any MVC framework, um, that will translate to a lot of other contexts for you. Um, just a little bit of trivia. If anybody has spent any time with Drupal, you'll notice that Drupal is an MVC, it's an MVVC framework. It's kind of like MVC nested. It's really, really bizarre. Um, this man in the back is learning it the hard way. All right. So uh, progressive enhancement. I talked about this because it's the uncertain web. We can't we can't assume too much of the environment in which our websites operate, or our web applications operate. If you build again with assuming HTTP and HTML is all you have, you're off to a good start. If the user has access to, uh, if they've got CSS, great. You can style the website. Um, if they have access to JavaScript, great. You can add some fancy interactions and maybe load the page without refreshing. But the key is just build content first. And this is going to be a theme throughout the whole, whole thing. Like If you build content first, you're positioning yourself <coughs> really well. Okay, accessibility. This, is, this has become sort of a pet peeve of mine. And I don't know that I'm the right guy to have a pet peeve about accessibility because I never built an accessible website. Like, <laughs> guilty. Totally guilty. Uh, but now that I'm working at O'Reilly and I'm meeting, uh, I'm, I'm being exposed to a lot of things that I wasn't before, I'm realizing just how goddamn critical it is. Accessibility isn't a feature. Lack of accessibility is a bug. Right? So, 
we're all going to need accessible websites, assistive technology someday. You know, our eyesight goes. Or we're having an emergency. Say something catastrophic just happened and we need to get, some get access to information really quickly. When our working memory is, when we're in crisis or when our working memory is tapped for whatever reason, we have less ability to comprehend what's in front of us. So that's when something like a, u a good user experience even can be considered an, uh, an accessibility consideration. If I go to a hospital or police website and it's not well designed for people who are in crisis, there's a failure there. There's a failure of design. Uh, the other thing I want to mention about accessibility is that statistically 10% of your users need accessible technology. Whether that is uh, the fact that they need to be able to use a screen reader on your website so you've got alt tags and semantic HTML and title tags. Or if that's about uh, having high contrast options for your design. Or if this is just about getting over the 11 point font and bumping up to the 16 point standard, which most people agree is where we should be. Now, I don't see many websites that actually go that far, but gray on gray, white on gray, uh, Tiny, tiny fonts, just don't do it. It's, it's cruel and unusual, um, especially to people who need accessible uh, technology. Okay, moving on from accessibility, security. And again, this isn't a pet peeve of mine, and I shouldn't have it as a pet peeve, because again, I've never built something that was very secure. Uh, <laughs> the key with security is that it's, you can't ignore it. You can't. And if you have a WordPress website, or you have a Drupal install somewhere, uh, say you run your own server, um, in all of those cases you are running software that you need to update regularly. If you have software that's not being updated, that's like your number one security vulnerability. Um, unpatched WordPress websites get hacked all the time. Cole can tell you what our access logs look like. Update. Yes, so seriously, update, update your web software, update the servers that it's running on, never let that lag. Um, and if you get to, if you're working with a framework and you're doing your own coding, you need to get yourself more familiar with security issues. Because if you're, if you yourself are handling user data and passing it onto a database, you want to make sure that you're sanitizing that data before it does something crazy to your database. Bobby tables. Yeah, we'll get the Bobby tables. <laughs> All right, SEO and shareability. Um, this, these are, these are. I put them together because they're related. Um, search engine optimization, meta tags still matter whether you like it or not. The title of your website still matters. Um, and shareability, like not just your meta tags, but have open graph meta tags in there. Um, and if you're feeling ambitious, go for the Twitter card, meta, Twitter card meta tags as well. What those do is those make sure that when, you, when a person shares a link to your website, that the, the information that Facebook or Twitter pulls up initially is decent. Now on Facebook, Facebook's kind of nice in this way in that if I share something on Facebook and I'm not happy with the title or the image that came through, I can upload a new image, I can edit the title. LinkedIn doesn't allow that, Google Plus doesn't allow that, Twitter doesn't allow that. So build in good meta tags, um, choose a good primary image, and your website will be that much more shareable. And I just want to mention that accessibility is related to these things. And so is a content-first approach and progressive enhancement. So if you have this approach, if, you're, if you subscribe to the philosophy that I'm trying to push on you all right now, then these things will be easy. Because you're not going to be fighting against Photoshop-first design or you know, whatever it is. Um, these things are all aligned. Um, I wasn't familiar with the Twitter and that other reference you made. And if you could just uh, it's, uh, open graph meta tags. Open graph? Open graph. That's something that Facebook came up with. Is it G-R-A-F? Uh, P-H. It is P-H. And the other one was a Twitter meta tag? That's right. And they call, I think those are for Twitter cards. Twitter cards. That's right. Twitter card. And, and, I, and I, again, I think about this when I'm thinking about the search engine optimization as well. Because I'm thinking about what's, what kind of title is going to pull somebody in. I'm thinking about what are the first 140 characters or you know, what are the first two sentences on that website that these website, that Facebook or other networks will pull up? Because that's the first impression someone's going to get. And that's how they decide whether they click or not. I mean, sure, the caption that someone shares that website with it matters too, but 
you got to meet them halfway. Okay, intellectual property. I'm not going to spend enough time on this. This is probably for everyone's uh, benefit that I won't. Uh, open source is, again, the reason why these technologies are so available. Open source is the reason why we have awesome things like WordPress and Drupal and we don't have to pay for them. Now, the trick is that you need to understand how that code is licensed, right? I think, I think Drupal's under GPL. I don't know what, what WordPress is under, but there are different types of open source licenses. There's GPL, there's MIT, there's, it's crazy. But you've got to know, because when you are creating a website for a client, your, your contract should have something in there about the licensing, right? If you're a graphic designer, you're probably used to having contracts that, where you're just licensing use of those graphics. They, don't, they may not own those graphics. It wasn't work for hire. Um, similarly with code, while you may be doing some work for hire in terms of the modifications that you put on top of Drupal or on top of WordPress, WordPress and Drupal are still GPL, right? You're not selling WordPress. You're not selling Drupal. And that's an important distinction to make. Um, just make sure that you have the proper language in your contracts and you're not selling GPL, because um, you can. Uh, and if you don't have something that covers intellectual property in your contracts, add it today. Add it today. There's plenty of boilerplate. And of course, boilerplate's a little sketchy, but it's a place to start. Don't sign a contract without having intellectual property addressed in there. All right. Stacks, fun part, fun part. Okay, I listed JavaScript at the fir at first here, not because it's my favorite, but because it's the favorite. JavaScript is not only one of the three main languages that make up the web, but now that we have Node.js, um, and there were tools in the past that could do this, but now but Node.js is really cracked it open. Now you can use JavaScript not only on the front end in the browser, but your web server can be JavaScript. You can be using JavaScript to pull your database and push rendered HTML out to the, to the client. The reason that that's novel is that that reduces complexity. If there's one thing that we're all dealing with when we're building websites, it's complexity. And we're trying to tame that complexity. It's very helpful if you can eliminate a whole language from your stack. If you use JavaScript instead of PHP, well then, an example of a, a benefit that you'd get is if I'm trying to get user input, say I want their, their email address, their name, and their phone number, um, I can <coughs> use the same JavaScript code to validate that user input on the front end and the back end. I can share that code. It's called isomorphic, isomorphic JavaScript. Having to only write it once means I, I don't have to maintain two different user validation code bases. I don't have to have two different sets of tests for those things. So it will seriously reduce your workload when you, um, if you're able to use JavaScript on the front end and the back end. Now this is still kind of early days for this. So you know, don't walk yourself out to the bleeding edge unless you're ready to get cut, but, um, but it's a very promising direction that we're going here. JavaScript is also where the mean stack comes into play. Uh, mean is MongoDB, uh, which is a document store. It's not a relational database. Uh, E is Express.js, uh, A is AngularJS, N is Node.js. Node is the thing that's running the JavaScript. Express and Angular are just frameworks on top of that. Mongo is the data store. One thing I want to caution you about uh, is defaulting to document stores. If you end up dealing with JavaScript, if you end up dealing with any stack or language that, um, where people love using document stores, you may find yourself using a document store, a NoSQL database, for something that totally should be a relational database. Um, just because it's nice that you don't have to create a schema doesn't mean that you should just completely ignore relational databases. They are your friend, and make sure you use the right database at the right time. Word of caution. Yeah. So in the mean stack, what's the relationship between Express and Angular? I understand the other that's a good question. Um, because Node is not a web server itself, Express is a small JavaScript web server that runs on Node. And so by combining Express with Angular, which is actually a JavaScript framework, um, you're able to have your web framework and your web server 
all in the JavaScript. So Angular is like the 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 in the browser side. That's the MVC part. Yes. So it's really it should be NEMA if you're going to do LAMP. It that, it's, be that's actually true. If you wanted to like actually make it yeah. uh, make sense. Node is Apache. Express is well, kind of underneath. Node is Linux. Express would be Apache. Right. right. So so mean is an it's not an exact translation from from LAMP, but uh, mean is a little mean is a little more memorable than NEMA. Um, <laughs> okay. Moving on from JavaScript, because there's just a whole lot there. Uh, PHP, which is where I spent most of my life as a web developer. Um, PHP, like JavaScript, like Go, like Perl, has a C-based syntax. If you're used to using those curly braces and having semicolons after every line, um, that's what I'm talking about, C-based syntax. Um, this is contrasted with languages like basic, uh, Python or Ruby, which are much more, uh, you can read them, and it makes some sense. Uh, so, anywho, PHP, C-based language, runs, I want to say, like 80% of the internet, or the web, at least. Um, it's insane how common it is. Now, PHP has come a long way since PHP 4 and PHP 5.0. Um, being a PHP developer going to technology conferences, people will like thumb their noses at me. Like I'm some sort of like runt developer. People will do the same thing with JavaScript. And I'm here to tell you that those people are wrong. Because yeah. PHP is awesome and so is JavaScript. Um, PHP 4 was wonky. And it's true that PHP is quirky, right? You've got function names that they, it's not always the same. I mean, sometimes there's an underscore, and sometimes there's not, and sometimes the parameter order is reversed, and it's, you never really know. It's, it's kind of uh, annoying that way. English of programming languages? <laughs> it is. It is totally, uh, what, what's, it's a creole. It's a creole of programming languages, and so is JavaScript. It's a, they're secondary languages based off of primary languages. Um, and so it, do, it has inherited a lot of quirks. Um, that doesn't make it a bad language, that just makes it a language you need to use a lot of reference material for. Uh, the thing that I want to say about PHP also is that between 4 and where we're at now, which is I think 5.5, five, it might be 5.6 or 7 now, uh, PHP has seriously evolved. It has um, namespacing, it's got, um, I can't even like go down the list. Anywho, PHP is a modern language. Don't let anybody tell you anything else. Within PHP, there are plenty of frameworks. There's Yi, Laravel, Symfony 2, a um, ton of options for frameworks. And again, you don't always need a CMS. Like, don't default to a CMS. Consider a framework if you, uh, if you have something that's more advanced or something that's not content-centric. Of course, in CMSs, we all know there's WordPress. I think we all know there's WordPress, Drupal, and Joomla. Uh, Joomla's fine, but I like making fun of it. Um, <laughs> WordPress is fine, but I also like making fun of that. Um, Drupal is, WordPress is what you want if you want an out-of-the-box solution that's going to work well. And you can do a lot with it. It's, it's just code. You can make it do anything you want. Um, Drupal is like Legos, and so it's, it's not, you're not going to get out-of-the-box Drupal. It's just not going to, it's not there. Um, question. Do you put Squarespace in that category? Um, Squarespace and Wix and Weebly I put in another category entirely. Because they're sort of self-serve websites and I, I have no idea what they're running on the back end. You know, they might give you areas where you can put in HTML and CSS to sort of customize things the way you like. Um, but they could be running Ruby on the back end, they could be doing anything. Um, they're more software as a service, they're not a platform That's right. Yeah, I use it myself, so I was just curious because it keeps mentioning WordPress and Julie, so I'm just wondering where you have those yeah. in relation to it. Now, there's a middle ground between the square spaces of the world and building your own system. There's Drupal Gardens and there's WordPress.com. Um, you can use WordPress, you can use Drupal, host it, and they'll, they'll, I mean, they will give you an out of the box experience. They'll give you something with the features already built into it, and you just change the design and add your content. Um, 
those are great ways to get comfortable with WordPress and Drupal, but they all, the, the analogy only goes so far, um, as Cole has told me when it comes to WordPress.com. It's, it's, it's kind of it's pretty different. Uh, but they're a good starting point if you're not ready to go from, say, Squarespace to rolling your own. <coughs> that's Drupal Gardens? Drupal Gardens, that's right. Does ModX fit in that spectrum somewhere? Yeah, I know. It's, it's like the CMS that no one's ever heard of. I've, I've had a couple of clients use it. Uh -huh. It's, it's um, I, don't, I don't know if you can download the code yourself, so it's hosted, but very programmable, something like that. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. And so this is another category. There are, there are hosted content management systems that are still very configurable. Um, hell, uh, there's a local company here, in, in, uh, here but over in Sebastopol called WebVanta. They have a Ruby-based CMS that is sold as a service. In fact, their target market, um, they've changed their business a bit, but their target market was web designers who wanted to build a design and have their clients write the copy and then not worry about the implementation of it. <coughs> so, yeah, Shopify is another great example of that. Uh, Magento, there are others in that category. Contigo as well. Contigo? Contigo. Okay, that's a new one to me. Yeah. What's the name of that? Sorry, I want to write. Contigo. K E N M T I G O. Thank you. So, um, so there, there is a, there's a vast middle ground between the total self-serve walled gardens and the, the roll your own options. Um, I, I love, as, as being a programmer and someone who has run my own server for many years, I like having full control. It really irks me to go use a service where I can't do whatever the hell I want. That said, sometimes that makes a lot more sense. You know, if I, if I, if I just have a one-off website that I'm building for someone and I don't want to have to worry about maintenance, there's no way I'm going to put that on my own server because I'm going to be tied at them to the hip forever, right? So there are times when it really does make sense to use these, these platforms um, as a service. Okay. Oh, question? So what do you think about some of like the next-gen CMS systems that out of the box provide multi-language personalization back into, you name it, the application, Salesforce, not just a, a database, but actually, you know, built it, you know. CRM and whatnot. Like. CRM, uh, but it doesn't have to be CRM, it could be new marketing applications, work out, um, and then, uh, let's see, um, and, and they're fairly robust in terms of their, their configurability. Yes. They've got links into, right. Um, what do you think about those, and what do you think about those as it pertains to the legacy of, of developing applications with PHP and stuff like that? I think there are... Okay, well, I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of, of, of O'Reilly, right? Because at O'Reilly, we've got Salesforce. We have a number of systems that we want to be able to get data into and out of and, and plug things into easily. Um, it might make sense for... <clears throat> an organization that already has committed to these vendors um, to, to use one of these more out-of-the-box solutions. The challenge as I see it is, as a developer, I worry sometimes about having as much control as I would like to have. Um, you know, there may be a way that I want to extend it, but I'm not able to. Um, but the biggest concern that I have is not as a developer, but as, as a business person, is that those often have a, a high monthly cost. And if your business, um, I, I don't like the idea of revenue sharing, right? So if I'm, I'm, in a, if I'm in a business and my website is a core part of, of, of revenue generating for, for what I do, I don't want to be paying a percentage of, of everything to uh, a myriad of, of software as a service and platform as a service vendors, right? That, that really limits my margins. However, it's often great to use those to start and then know that you can slowly sub in one module at a time as you, as you grow your own IT infrastructure. Um, I think there are business cases where those make a lot of sense. I, I haven't been in a lot of those situations. Um, and just being a developer, I really like being able to get my hands dirty and 
sometimes they don't allow that, which bugs me. Um, so that's not saying that they're not valid, that's just saying that I'm not a huge fan of them as an op option personally. Um, but I, I don't think they're going away anytime soon. I think we're going to see more of this. I mean, we see Adobe Marketing Cloud, we see Salesforce expanding into marketing automation. You know, all these vendors are, are expanding their software suites into massive behemoths. I mean, HubSpot, you mentioned Marketo. Um, there are a lot of offerings out there, and I think it really depends on your specific situation, whether or not those make sense. Um, but I certainly think they're, they're a good option in some cases. Okay. Uh, Python. Python is another really fantastic language. It's a language that I recommend people learn if they haven't ever learned to program. Um, it's either that or JavaScript. It's not that it's an easy language, it's just that it's been around, it's mature, and because it's not C-based syntax, you can read it. It feels a lot more natural than semicolons and brackets everywhere. Um, you know, there's, I have a friend who's a, a chemist and she ha was going through a course and they had to do programming. Uh, I don't know what environment this was in or what language it was in, but it was a C-based language. And to hear my friend, the chemist, bitch to me about finding, uh, about like spending hours hunting down an errant semicolon, like, mm -hmm. just don't, just don't, don't do that. Like, that's cruel for beginners. Um, but the reason that you would choose Python, even if you're not a beginner, is that there is a rich ecosystem of libraries, frameworks, um, and content management systems. There's Django, there's Pylons, there's Plone, there's Pyramid, there's, God, there's another one called Wagtail or something bizarre like that. What's that? Yep, yep, uh, and Mezzanine. Anywho, there are a ton of options on Python. They're all fantastic. They're mostly fantastic. Uh, but what really, <laughs> but really, what sets Python apart in my in my estimation is its applications in science and data science. Like, there's no doubt in my mind that Python has the single richest ecosystem for dealing with data, processing data, analyzing. Like, if you're in science or in your marketing and business intelligence, Python's where you want to go. Uh, there's a book that O'Reilly has called Mining the Social Web, and it's all about processing data with Python. So uh, the other thing that's nice about Python is there's this tool called Jupyter, formerly known as IPython Notebooks. If you're in the business of, say, preparing a report for someone and you wanting to be able to share that and share the steps of how you generated that data and making it repeatable, you can write in IPython Notebook, excuse me, in Jupyter, uh, you can have code snippets in there and they can be in little steps. So you have your code snippet that first retrieves all the Twitter handles or something. You've got another code snippet that you run and then it checks to see how many are connected with each other. Um, and then the last step, it produces some crazy graphic for you. you know, whatever it is, an IPython notebook is basically a way for you to share these reports, um, these interactive reports. And it's, it's really powerful. And it's, it's great in context of science and and marketing and uh, making the business cases with people. Uh, you're not really going to, you're never going to use that in production. Like if you're building a web application, you're not going to use that. But it's still a very nice tool to have. And if you are fluent in Python, it's right there for you. Now the reason I renamed it to Jupyter is it actually supports other languages now. It's way beyond Python. But uh, that's just a tool to be aware of that's very useful. Ruby. Ruby. Ruby I think of like Python. Um, they're both languages that are kind of magical. And what magical means in context of programming is that there may be a keyword or a function in there that does a lot. And it's kind of a black box, right? And sometimes it'll do things that you may not expect it to do. You might have character encoding issues in there somewhere and you don't know why. And, uh, magical is fun. Magical's really great when you're a programmer. You can be productive and it can be enjoyable because you're not rewriting the same little subroutines. But the reality is, unless you uh, when, when, it's, when it's magical, it's also harder to do performance optimization. Um, it's also harder to do like security auditing. There are all these things that are less possible the more magical your programming language or framework is. Uh, so magic, it's, it cuts both ways. Um, and, I, and I should mention, I'm sorry, I moved on from Python before I mentioned this. Python is, uh, there's, a, there's an idea known as Pythonic. Uh, there is, there's like a zen of Python. There is one way to do everything, like, and 
there, like it's, you can go to communities and they'll show you, oh, this is what you're trying to do? Well, this is the pattern you want for that. Now, in programming, there are always uh, a lot of different ways to solve the problem. But Python sets out to make it obvious that there's one elegant, right way to do something. It's the one true way. The one true way, exactly. And it's so beautiful sometimes. Uh, I mean, people sometimes will say Python code is poetic, and I've never heard that used with any other, any other language. Uh, Ruby. Ruby is special. Ruby and Python, neither of them are very performant. Um, they are not as, they're not as optimized, they're not as close to the metal as, say, PHP, uh, PHP is, or even JavaScript these days. They're better than straight Java and then that's so not enough. <laughs> True, when you've got a virtual machine that changes everything. Yeah. Um, but, but you can still get performance out of these things. It doesn't mean they're not performant and that you can't use them. It just means that if you have uh, an application built in Python or Ruby and you have a critical application pathway that's, that's slow, that means that, well, maybe you need to figure out what plugins are being used. You might need to re have someone reauthor those plugins in C++ or, uh, or, or Go or some other lower level language. And then the Python or the Ruby will call on that rather than running more Python. So there are ways to get the performance you want out of Ruby and Python, but just know that they're not going to come as easily as with other languages. OK, Go. Go is a recent addition to this. Go is really interesting. It's, an app, it's a language that was created by Google and is particularly suited to uh, concurrency. There is no language that I'm aware of other than functional style languages that make it as easy as Go does to work, uh, to build software that runs concurrently. And the reason that's meaningful is as we move to cloud computing, where my web application isn't on one little server in Sonic's data center, my web application is on dozens of machines and it scales up and down as demand is needed, um, my application needs to be able to run in parallel. And uh, if you've ever tried to run something that's like thread safe and avoid race conditions and all of the weird edge issue cases that you run into with concurrent programming and parallel processing, that, it's a nightmare. It's seriously a nightmare. So Go ad really addresses all of those. It makes it easy to do things well and, and safely. Uh, people say Go is uh, going to take off. Some people say Go is going to eat Ruby and Python's lunch. I don't believe it, but I, I do think it's a very useful tool to be aware of. All right, Perl. Perl. Ah. <laughs> it's another C-based language. It is the most. I guess beauty's in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> um, so is ugly. Yeah, it's true. Is and there still a ton of pro floating around O'Reilly? Oh yeah. yeah, and places maybe it shouldn't be. Um, the hackers love. It's true. Pearl. Pearl is the language of the sysadmins, and Python is also is, is increasingly the language of sysadmins, meaning that you're writing server-side scripts that'll do things on your server. Um, a lot of web hosting software is built in Perl. If, you, if anyone's ever used cPanel or Web Host Manager or Parallels, uh, Plesk, uh, that's all written in Perl. And that basically is just an interface that's pulling the strings of your web server for you. That's all it's doing. Uh, I would not personally recommend that anybody who is becoming a web developer become proficient in Perl. I wouldn't make that recommendation. But the Perl community would be very upset with me if I didn't <laughs> still talk about the merits of Perl. Perl is tried and true. Perl is in a lot of places already. The module ecosystem for Perl will blow your minds. Uh, it's to the point that it's often hard to know what the right choice is because it's been done 10 different ways very well over the last 30 years. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, there are some source, Randy. I was going to say that uh, Perl is the COBOL of the web. If you guys know, if anybody knows business languages for, for financial, COBOL is like where people, you know, people have been programming COBOL for 40 years, mm -hmm. probably longer, and, um, and almost definitely longer. Mm -hmm. and banks still yeah, but I mean, banks are still using it, Wall Street still uses it. You can be a COBOL programmer today if you already know it, but you don't want to go learning it. Right. <laughs> so that's, 
<laughs> exactly. So it's not a choice that you, it may not be a choice that you want to make, but it's out there and it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, if you really want job security, find someone who will train you in Perl or Cobol. <laughs> you know, you, I mean, because there's not, there's not a huge market, there's not a huge supply of developers who do that, um, the rates that they can charge is pretty ridiculous. Uh, but it's, I think you'd have to be self-loathing as a developer to go the route. That route. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. All right, functional languages. So functional, one of these is not like the others, and that's functional, right? Because these are not functional as a programming paradigm, like object-oriented or, or procedural. But those are programming languages. But I'm including functional as a category because it's not something that we see a lot of on the web, but I think we're seeing more and more of it. Functional programming lends itself to, uh, again, to things like Go. To, it lends itself to concurrency. Um, when you have a functional application, it's, it's stateless is one way to put it. Um, when something goes wrong, the whole thing comes tumbling down. You don't end up with a application that's like you've got to clean up after. Like it's functional. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so functional languages are increasingly important. I think the more we move towards cloud computing, the more we move towards uh, applications scaling up and down on demand, I think functional languages will, will see more and more use. That said, most programming languages have some form of functional support, right? PHP wasn't built as an object-oriented language, but it now has object-oriented features in it. Many of these languages are having functional style like bolted on, um, and that's, that's fine. That's probably all you'll ever need. But if you do wonder about functional, there is um, there's a stack called Lice, the unfortunately named Lice. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Um, I think that's Linux, uh, Yasad. I'm sorry, I don't remember what it is. But there are, there are functional stacks out there uh, for, for programming for the web. Um, they're rare, but they're becoming more common. Uh, if you work with data or if you work with applications that are going to scale a lot, scale a lot, then you might want to consider it. L-Y-C-E, L-Y-C-E. L-Y. Yeah. L-Y. Yeah. But slightly better. So, uh, only slightly though, right? OK, any question about stacks? Any of the stacks? OK, Of course, Great. Lice goes along with Y and L-Y and yeah, it, that, yeah, that's true. That's true. That is another stack. Um, OK, the last remark I'm going to make here is that for instant employability, PHP, because there's WordPress gigs everywhere, please. So I have a kind of an obscure question. Okay. For uh, Ruby slash Rails slash Sinatra, yes. can you use uh, unit testing and RSpec at the same time? Do you know, or does somebody else here know? I don't know. Randy, do you know? I don't know what RSpec is, but I see it mentioned. I've never used RSpec. Um, uh, is, is this a Ruby uh, tool? Uh, RSpec, yeah, Ruby. I'm yeah, there. I'm not a, I'm not a Ruby uh, actor by any means. Um, that's a great question for the Hacks and County um, uh, group. They, there's plenty of Ruby knowledge in that group right. that, that has that question. And they will probably have opinions. They will definitely have opinions. <laughs> they're, they're great for that. Uh, OK, so again, just to recap. In, I, I look at PHP as instant employability. It's just a really easy way to suddenly be employable on, for small business websites. Um, but don't stay there, right? I mean, you, that may even be your main language for the rest of your career, but don't stay there. You really ought to become competent with other things. And not just because maybe PHP will become less employable over time, but because those different types of languages, they offer you different features. And unless you know what each language offers you, um, you won't know what you're missing. And it's also true that there are often solutions in one language or in one programming paradigm that you can translate over to another. So I really encourage people to be polyglots. Um, I'm working on this myself. I've coded JavaScript via jQuery for a long time, but I still don't really know JavaScript. So personally, I started with PHP. I'm going to Python and JavaScript right now. Um, but if you're just getting started and you don't care about getting a job in development right now, but you want to be very employable soon, 
JavaScript, I think, is the way to go. I think a lot of people are hiring for that. Maybe not so much in Sonoma County and Marin County, but if you look in San Francisco and the Valley, it's crazy. They're just snatching up JS coders like left and right. All right. Okay, I'm gonna talk about gotchas. These are like, just avoid these things, all right? Uh, even if you're writing code only for yourself, even if you're writing code only to be used maybe a couple times, document it. That poster on that wall is a cautionary tale. Always code as if the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. <laughs> Seriously. And sometimes that violent psychopath is you. <laughs> you know, I've written code any number of times and come back to it needing it later, and it just, huh, God, I just hate myself. What was I thinking? You know, and then I have to write it again, or I have to like slowly tweak it to work the way that I want it to work. Uh, just do yourself and all future coders and all people who inherit your code a favor and write your documentation as you write your code. And all future versions of yourself. <laughs> yes, be kind to your future self. Um, Corollary of this is you really should be writing tests as you code. Ideally, you should be writing your tests, you should be writing your documentation, and you should be coding kind of all at once. These are not discrete phases. OK. JavaScript, yes? The uh, documentation, can you suggest a resource for uh, learning to properly document? Not off the top of my head, but that's a really good question. Yeah, we should. <laughs> there's a there's a, a new conference that just started up called Write the Docs, and it's all about uh, it's all it's about this specifically, and, and really zooming in on documentation as a subject. So uh, there's a body of knowledge here that I will use to get back to. You. Okay, JavaScript required. Again, when you're coding for the web. Take nothing for granted but HTML and HTTP, right? Because not everything is going to run JavaScript. Your stuff should really work with that JavaScript. And while Google search engine does kind of run JavaScript now, it's still, JavaScript is not SEO friendly. Uh, JavaScript will often break the back button on browsers. It just does insane things. Like, so don't lean on JavaScript too hard. Um, don't assume that everyone's going to have it. Uh, if you have a link that is active, that fires off like, some JavaScript function, it should also actually link to a different page, right? Because if JavaScript's not running, that function won't fire. Uh, I, yeah, I can't say it enough. JavaScript required is a mistake. Don't do it. Photoshop first. Photoshop first. This is, uh, this is less of a problem these days. Uh, mm -hmm. But I know for me, when I was freelancing, and I wore all of the hats. I was a designer, developer, writer, sysadmin, salesperson. That's not uncommon among freelancers. Um, I would often go directly. I wouldn't even go to my like notepad. I would go straight to Photoshop, make like a 1024 by 768 canvas, and start making columns. And this is not how you should web design do web design in, in like the modern world. Like there are some cases, some narrow cases where that's okay, but. Um, North Bay designers could talk, talk on this subject. Nate Bauer did a talk for us recently. Um, and what he, what he uh, does is he uses style tiles. Style tiles show, oh, will do things like show um, a logo treatment. Oh, here are the font faces you're going to use for the different types of the web, different parts of the website. Um, it'll show you the color palette and how it's used in different places. What it won't do is tell you what the layout is. Because layout and design, they're related, but they're not the same. You know, your creative director, um, when they're thinking about the, uh, the feel of this website and the, the, the type of, and, and what it's communicating to people, they shouldn't also be thinking about the layout. Like, they may think about that later, but those are two different thought processes. So the style tiles, style tiles allow you to decouple the aesthetic from how it's actually implemented. Um, your developer, if, if developers love style tiles, let me just say that. Uh, I've, when I, back in the day, was given like a design to implement and a designer found that I didn't implement it pixel perfect across all browsers. <laughs> I just give me a style tile and then we can all agree on the end result. Um, what is a style tile? 
So a style tile, you would have a series of style tiles to, sh to demonstrate how uh, title text looks, or what a link looks like. Your style tile might show what a navigation button looks like when you hover over it or when you hover off of it. But a style tile doesn't show you that plus the layout, right? So when you look at a finished website, it's got a layout, it's got the content, and it's also got the aesthetic, like all in one. But before you get to that point, a style tile allows you sort of de to decouple all of those things. When you're developing a website with its style and its layout and its code all together, it's, it, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, because when one thing is wrong and you want to change it, you have to change all of the things. When you have style tiles, that allows you to be a lot more, uh, a lot more nimble. And the, the, way to think, the way I think about it is, if a designer were to give me style tiles, they're not telling me, um, they're doing their jobs and it's exactly what they're good at doing. They're good at doing typographic treatments. They're good at creating uh, brand and logos and choosing the right colors. But they don't need to be a layout specialist. And frankly, again, the web, uncertainty is a feature, not a bug. They're not going to be able to figure out all of the layouts. So by them giving you style tiles, that, that gives you just enough information to start creating CSS rules to apply to your HTML. Um, and when the aesthetic changes, it's easy to change that rather than have it be like linked into the, uh, the layout. It basically sounds like a style sheet with just with not necessarily written technically. Yes, very, very much so, very much so. Uh, yeah, a, a non-coded style sheet, more or less. So, uh, and again, style tiles will show you what's an H1, H2, what's H3, H, you know, all the, what do all the headers look like, what do bullets look like, what do links look like, and it focuses on how each of those is rendered um, when they're active and when they're not, rather than providing a mock-up of an entire website. It's a different approach to design. Now, I will say, if you're, if you're a designer developer, and there are a lot of people who straddle those worlds. Sometimes it does make sense to do all at once. I, I still disagree with the process, but let's be practical here. Like if you're only making so much in a project, or if you're not getting paid for it, you do what you've got to do. Okay. Bloat. Bloat. Ah, bloat. This is kind of related to JavaScript required because just because you want to have a little JavaScript in your website doesn't mean you need jQuery. Right? Like, don't get carried away with your modules and your libraries. It's easy for me with a, when I build a Drupal website to download all of the modules and enable all of the modules and just have it be this super powerful thing that begins to crumble because it's, there's just too much there. Um, choose your extensions wisely. Um, it's not just about making sure that there's a body of support and a body of knowledge around that extension, that module, whatever it is. But it's making sure that you need it. If you only need it for one feature, is that feature necessary? Is there another way to do that? There are websites today that are like, um, I, I shit you not. There are websites that if you, like mainstream websites, where you go to them, they'll download like four megabytes of content before you really see anything. You go to a lot of uh, like mainstream news websites, they're downloading a ton of crap, like so much stuff. And if you're on your mobile phone, if you don't have 4G, you're screwed. And let's be real, like, we're in North, Northern California, like, we don't have the best reception. If that's how we f experience it, think about the people in developing nations. I mean, there are billions of people out there, and if you are assuming that they're going to have JavaScript, if you're assuming that they have broadband, then you're missing out on, you're excluding tons of people. And maybe, maybe that's okay, maybe that's fine with your business model. But uh, generally, that's not desirable, right? OK, little bobby tables. So little bobby tables, you know, I really should have just had the comic in here. Yeah. Uh, I have a link to it. Little bobby tables is, a, is an XKCD reference. And I will give the link to that later, because I'm not going to explain a comic. That's not funny. Um, <laughs> the idea behind little bobby tables is uh, input sanitization. When, you have, when you're accepting user input, whether it's, whether it's a phone number, a name, what, it doesn't matter what it is, don't trust it. Like, don't, don't trust it. It's not that your user is trying to do something crazy. Maybe they're doing something dumb. It's not that your users are doing something dumb. Maybe someone's being malicious. 
You know, you never know where this user input is coming from. Um, there are any number of there are man in the middle attacks. There are so many ways for things to get uh, exploited that you really should never ever trust your own data. So. What I mean by that is when I accept, say, uh, an email address in a, in a web form, I need to run th some filters over that before I inject that to my database. So say I've got my query, insert blah into, uh, insert blah into table person. Well, if that blah, that user data that I've accepted, has some special characters like a semicolon or a uh, a quotation mark and a semicolon and then a couple comments and then it has its own SQL query. Well, that's called an X SQL injection attack and someone just ran their own query on your database and God only knows what it did. Did it delete your user's table? Did it echo your user's table, God forbid? Um, you know, we hear you know, the security breaches we hear about, uh, they're just, it's crazy how often they're happening now and they're happening to giant companies. But those are just the ones we hear about. I mean, they happen to, to little people like us all the goddamn time. Um, so take your security seriously. Sanitize all your inputs. Um, oftentimes you will not, if you're using WordPress or WooFoo and you, 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 you're not really coding, you may not need to worry about that. But the moment you get into the code, make sure you're sanitizing your inputs. And never, never run a query, an ask the database query with like a user variable, like just unsanitized. It's, it's terrible. Um, anyway, yeah, I'll link the little bobby tables, and I promise you'll laugh. <laughs> okay, the law of leaky abstractions. This is not a, uh, all right, this is not uh, a gotcha so much as just something to be aware of. We're in web development. We have so many layers of, of abstractions beneath us that we take for granted. Um, anyone here who's mucked around with C++ knows that you have garbage collection and you have to worry about buffer overflows and, and memory leaks. Um, we, do care about the, we do care about the memory on the web, but we don't have to work so hard to make it secure. We don't have to work so hard to, um, to, uh, to make things work. So that's convenient. That's really great. It means we can be much more productive. The more abstract something is, typically the more productive you can be with it. Um, the challenge is for ourselves, again, like myself, a Drupal developer, used Drupal for way too long, I got comfortable and I forgot how to, I basically forgot how to code. Like I could code, but I couldn't put a system together. That's, that's ridiculous. Um, the last little gotcha of law of leaky abstractions is uh, I think rich text editors and WYSIWYG editors are, are like demon spawn. Um, because this, this came out in context of, of Drupal 8 which was going to implement a rich text editor slash WYSIWYG, which basically means like you could be on your homepage, you could click on the content, and you could edit the content in line, which would be super convenient, especially if you're just a site builder or a site author uh, rather than like the person who builds the website. But there's a problem. Because if I'm the client and I'm on my website and I want to change the title of the headline of this article, I'm just going to change it what I see, and I'm going to assume that it's going to be fine if it shows up fine on my desktop. But what if that headline's too long for mobile? What if I inserted some HTML that's not going to render well in some places? Um, these abstractions, can, you can really like shoot yourself in the foot if you get too comfortable with them. So never get too comfortable. All right, we're almost done here. I'm so sorry. This is taking a long time. What's next? Because there's all this awesome stuff, and we're all coding on the web, and you're going to make some choices about the stacks that you want to use. Follow the web, follow the web's best. Seriously, like WIMP is great and all, and we do have some very talented people here. Just Cole really is a rock star. Um, <laughs> but look beyond your local community. Eric Meyer, Eric Meyer is amazing. Rachel Nabors, queen of animation, web animation, comic book artist, gone web developer. Jacob Nielsen, he's the UX research king. Um, seriously, uh, follow him, and he's got a lot of great advice for how to make your websites usable um, and make, the, make them convert well. Jen Simmons, awesome last name. Um, she gave one of my favorite keynotes last year at Fluent uh, called A Love Letter to HTML, and it really was extolling a lot of the virtues that I, I spoke about today um, in that HTML is accessible, it's ubiquitous, 
and it's freaking awesome. Uh, Kyle Simpson is a JavaScript pro. He is seriously like on the cutting edge. So if you yourself don't want to bleed, follow these people, because they'll show you what's coming, and they'll help point you to educational resources when they're available. And then there's Leah Haru, CSX, CSS expert. She's writing CSS secrets, which you can get for free. Uh, I have a URL that you're going to want to copy down in a moment here. Estelle Weil wrote Mobile HTML5, just another amazing person. And then Luke Robo Robolski, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, but he presented at WordCamp SF last year, and he, is, uh, he was one of the early proponents of responsive design. Another great guy to follow. OK, join the community. You're here. This is progress. Uh, stay involved. Stay involved, not just with WIMP, but there's Hacks Sonoma County, and find other groups to get, get involved with as well. There's North Bay Designers. Uh, the community's online and off, too, so don't stick to just one. Give back. This is a photo from WIMP Gives. We need volunteers for WIMP Gives. Uh, we need people to help run the event and also to actually build stuff. Um, but beyond WIMP Gives, there is also open source. Again, open source, like, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, and we can pay it forward by adding to the open source projects that we use every day. And if you really have a strong stomach and you're really feeling adventurous, uh, join the standards bodies and help create the standards that we all use. But seriously, not for the faint of heart. <laughs> and get to work. Get to work. Um, and this is the last bit that I'll dwell on a little bit. Um, there are a lot of ways to exist as a web developer. You can go freelance, you can work in agencies, you can work at startups, you can work as internal IT in large organizations. Um, there are really a lot of contexts you can work in. But the challenge and something that I said I would speak to is saturation. Because this is an industry that's so easy to get into, it's so cheap, you just need time um, and maybe some money for some educational resources. It's saturated and you need to differentiate yourself. Um, if I could count the number of WordPress developers that I've met, I just, it's just countless. There, there's just so many of them. Um, and there are a lot of people doing small business web development. So there are ways to specialize. And of course, generally you can specialize on an industry, you can specialize on a technology. But there are some specific directions you could go also as a web developer. Once you have basic web development, you can move on to higher level engineering and architecture. You can move on to web operations and DevOps. You can do technical, technical marketing. This is where I've moved. Uh, user experience design and information architecture. It's a different direction to go with it, but those are things that you can become expert in. There's always data science. And uh, if you really just prefer working with people but still enjoy the technology, go into management. I mean, that's, a, that's a totally valid career choice. Last, don't stop learning. Oh. Question. What about um, combining that with security, with someone who's interested in security? That's something I should have mentioned. Security is definitely a specialization that we, we need more of. Um, there's, there's a serious lack of security in, in, in web development in general. So I think, um, and people who specialize in that get paid really well too. So what about in Sonoma County? Do you think there's a need for that locally? I think you might have. I think there's a need for that, but I think you might have a challenge selling that to the people who need it. Mm -hmm. Question? Management. Yeah, absolutely, management. Um, but don't go into management unless you really want to manage people. It's just All right. Are there any particular areas on your list that you feel are underserved? Mm -hmm. um, I, for one, I mean, I'm, I'm biased, and, and this could just be an artifact of where I am. But I actually think there's a real lack of technical marketers. Uh, people who, not marketing technologists, not like people who started in marketing and picked up a ton of technology. That's a totally valid perspective, but I flip that on its head. Someone who comes to marketing with a technology background. Uh, I mean, I, am, I was the first programmer that O'Reilly hired in their marketing department. And the shit that I got done like, I made best friends real quick because I was able to make tedious tasks go like that. Um, and I was also able to bridge the gap between marketing department and our IT department who didn't know what we needed. And we didn't, and my department didn't know how to communicate what we needed because you didn't, you didn't know what you could build. So um, 
I think there's a lot to be said for people who have both marketing and technology chops. Um, I think Randy would agree with me, and I think there are, um, I think it's kind of a newish thing, but I think it's going to be a growing thing. We hope. I certainly hope. <laughs> Otherwise, I chose the wrong career. Oh. All right, never stop learning. Books, blogs, videos, if you have to. There's, the course, there's courses and boot camps. Um, lastly, there are community and corporate conferences. WIMP Camp is a community conference. O'Reilly Fluent or Ofcon is a corporate conference. They're all amazing for different reasons. Seriously, never stop learning. Okay, I promise we're almost done. <laughs> this, I'm not gonna read it for you. This, I don't care how cool iOS is. I don't care how awesome Swift the language is. We're not getting away from the web. Mobile apps are a blip. If you write for the web, you can cross compile it and get it on all of the phones. Seriously, web developer, it's a really excellent position to be in. Um, soon you can get into robotics with web development too. There's already JavaScript running, uh, ways to run JavaScript and do microcontrollers and all that awesomeness. The web, it's a good place to be. Okay, all right, so. Uh, I'm actually turning this meandering mess into a book. Uh, I'm turning uh, for O'Reilly. That's going to be out. Supposed to be done this month, so uh, it should be out in the next few months. Uh, it's of the same title, "Becoming a Web Developer." It's going to be a free book. Um, thank you for letting me experiment here because I needed to discover what I didn't include and what's awkward and what's what flows. Um, this is probably very hard to read. But O'Reilly, like the bit.ly link, but O'Reilly, slash B-A-W, becoming a web developer. There's a free ebook from O'Reilly that you can get there. There's CSS secrets, there's a book on information architecture, there's books on JavaScript, and I, I actually even included Perl. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So O'Reilly slash B-A-W. So are there, is there an underscore between free and ebook, or do we? Oh, no, sorry, please. Ignore. So the URL starts at O R E I L L Y. So O'Reilly slash Bod. Hey, hey Josh. Yes, sir. There's a JavaScript error on the sign in page for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't sign in right now. Oh, Are you serious? I'm serious. Oh, super Are you serious. sure? That's not my infrastructure. That's, yeah. that's O'Reilly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, O'Reilly, you sure don't have the best job. Yeah, it sounds like I got a bug report to file. There you go. Uh, give it a couple days. Yeah, if that, doesn't, if that doesn't work, just wait a few days. Uh, seriously, those are excellent books, so don't miss it. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.